here we are. Valley Health presents postpartum anxiety. Um, apologies here. My, hold on one sec. I apologize. It doesn't seem to be. Okay, there we go. Um, just a word about West Bergen. I know Danielle was kind enough to um, talk about us. I'll just spend a minute. Uh, West Bergen Mental Health Care has been around the uh, overall village of Ridgewood since the early 1960s, actually. We're a nonprofit. Um, we are a mental health center. One of the things that, that I think differentiates us is we have a huge focus on children and families. I'm not sure that the whole community is quite aware of that. And so that's why we came to mind when it came to talking about postpartum anxiety. We have all kinds of specialty programs around depression and anxiety and autism. Um, you name it, we do it. Um, we also have a large residential program um, and that people may be familiar with. Um, recently, in the last couple of years, we're doing a large focus on working in schools. And so we're excited and happy about that. So we're a big team and we're a big program. Um, I like to think of West Bergen as sort of the one of the quiet mile uh, mainstreams of um, the Ridgewood and surrounding community. We quietly treat thousands of people and um, we appreciate uh, being invited today. We appreciate your support. Um, we also do lots of volunteer opportunities and there's our website there. So I won't spend too much time on that. Let's talk a little bit about postpartum anxiety. And to start off, what a strange concept. It really is a paradox because here we are in the, in the time in life when we should be, should be celebrating and jumping up and down and be excited and congratulations. This is life altering. And it's really an exciting and joyous time in, in a person's life. Um, in many ways, uh, mom and dad or mom and mom, would, uh, dad and dad uh, spend nine months preparing in every way possible for this. And um, it just seems really out of sync when suddenly there's anx anxious feelings um, or distress or, or those kind of things. Lots of social norms around it. You have baby showers and gifts and balloons. So imagine what it's like to be having all kinds of balloons around you and gifts and wrapping paper and people congratulating you and you're not feeling well. You're feeling anxiety. You're feeling nervousness. You may be feeling sadness. Um, what a, a, a strange paradox um, for us to deal with. Lots of folks feel embarrassed by this. So I am really proud of each and every person that decided to come today. I'm proud of Valley Health System for even wanting to talk about this because it's a real issue. Um, and the good news, let me be very, very, very clear. The good news is it's without question treatable. We can do something about postpartum anxiety. We can do something about postpartum uh, depression as well. Still, you may have feelings of, of embarrassment um, and depression and anxiety can be really hard to talk about. So I'm really happy that you're here. Um, know that it is a funny feeling, um, again, with this kind of paradox um, around uh, this particular topic. My apologies, there we go. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the stats. Um, baby blues is, is a common um, phrase that's um, talked about. And here's a, a, a significant percentage, 70, seven zero of women post-birth um, report baby blues. Um, for most folks, it, it's short lasting. It can be in the two to six week range. Um, it doesn't typically interfere with daily activities. It doesn't usually require additional treatment, but 70% of women having had birth, having given birth, um, really struggle with some type of anxiety, some type of nervousness, some type of fear and depression. And so that is most, if you think about it. So um, if you take nothing else away from today's talk, please know that this is a very normal thing, that, that more women that have children have this than do not have it. So um, I hope that that provides a little bit of solace in terms of, of that feeling of it must be me. Um, it is not you, it's you and 70% of other people. Um, here's an interesting stat. I have to tell you, I did a little research for this as we were putting this talk together. This one surprised me. 4% of men experience depression after the birth of their child. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. Obviously it's not hormonal or, or, or biochemical, but there's social reasons and there's often economic reasons. Um, there's often a, a realization for these gentlemen where, whoa, this is real. This is actually happening. Where I guess leading up to those nine months leading up to it, it was a little more abstract and a little more uh, conceptual. So a little bit scary for those guys. Um, so here we are. 
with one in seven women experiencing technical postpartum depression and depression and anxiety sit on a, on a continuum. So um, think about those words together. Um, there are some pre-existing conditions that, that um, may lend itself to that. Um, so a pre-existing mood disorder. So if you've had depression over the years, if you've had um, significant anxiety, generalized anxiety, or, or just struggled with, with emotional life um, leading up to it, you are more likely to experience postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety. Um, if there's a family history of depression in particular, and so you want to be talking to uh, mom and um, Aunt Jenny and grandma about what their experiences were, remembering, of course, that a generation or two ago, we didn't talk about these things. There, this talk would have never occurred a generation or two ago. And that's why we're so proud to be here today. Um, but know that if you can, if you can just inquire a little bit with your mom or your aunt or your great aunt, is there any kind of family depression, any type that happened, um, both postpartum and non-postpartum, by the way. Um, anxiety as well can be very intergenerationally transferred. Um, so um, other risk factors include women with little or no social support. No surprise here. So those women that are, that are having children or having a child and don't really have an infrastructure around them, don't have um, social support, um, are more likely to experience postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety. And of course, um, women who have had a stressful event during pregnancy. So, um, and that can be anything, uh, relationship issues. Did the, did the relationship, uh, if it was a marriage, did that end? Um, was there unemployment? Are there significant financial issues? Was there an illness or a death in the family, um, perhaps of, of a mom or a grandmother? Um, those also lend themselves toward um, pre-existing conditions that can be risk factors. Um, it's something that we as clinicians really think about something that we um, focus on because we like to we like to be prepared and um, you can do that as well. Let me just hit the next. I'm so sorry that this is going to be a little funky. Apologies for that. Excuse me one sec. There we go. Okay, so symptoms of postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression um, include a, a, any of the following, and they can be all of them or some of them. And, and I, I, I'm always a little hesitant to go over these lists because please know that all of us in day-to-day -day life at times are going to have absolutely everything on this list. So know that this is just one way that we as clinicians think about and focus on, um, on postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression. Um, know that, that just because you're having one or even two or three of those things, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're suffering per se, but it means that you're struggling. And so let's, let's think about these. So feeling sad or reporting depressed mood, um, so, and that can include also nervousness and anxiety, um, just, just kind of revved up, inability to kind of calm down. Um, changes in appetite. Here again, we're, we're challenged a little bit because remember that, especially when we're dealing with postpartum, um, we're, we're dealing with, with you as, as a woman who was pregnant for nine months, there were all kinds of changes in appetite and all kinds of changes in um, energy level. See that next bullet point where we're looking for energy level, increased fatigue, um, loss of energy. Pregnancy is a hard thing on a body. So know that we're looking within context. But if you do see significant changes in appetite, significant loss in energy and increased fatigue, um, know that, that that could be antenna up. So what I'm asking you to do is to think about these and simply have it be a marker for you to give further thought to and further um, research to. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that you meet any kind of diagnoses. What people and, and women in particular who struggle with um, postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression often uh, relay or, or share with clinicians is a feeling of um, worthlessness or um, guiltiness. They feel guilty. They don't feel like they're good enough. Um, they feel like they're being a bad mom. They feel like they're ill-equipped. There's this, what we would call negative cognition. So there's this negative scripts that are playing out over and over and over again. Um, that to me is actually a bigger indicator than the changes in appetite and uh, changes in energy. Cause I'm not sure on the energy and appetite, whether those are, are biophysical. Um, crying for no reason. So just significant bouts of crying. I don't mean welling up um, at, at a commercial or, or when your uh, baby looks incredibly adorable um, and, and maybe your, your aunt or your mom is holding them and you well up, I mean, bouts of crying. So unstoppable, you're not really able to 
um, pull that together. And, and it feels like it's for no reason where there, it's not entirely clear that there's a stimulus for that. Um, Pat, passing thoughts of death or suicide, certainly significant indicator that we have a postpartum depression going on. Um, and, and passing thoughts of death sometimes are common in depression. They're not, it's not the same thing as suicidality um, or being suicidal. There, there's a, a, a perspective when someone is depressed where they feel like life would be better off if I was dead, or I might be better off if I was dead. It doesn't mean that they're actively suicidal. And I get that that sounds a little funny, um, and it's it's up to a, a really well-trained clinician to tease those two apart, but they but they usually can be um, teased apart. Again, feelings of being a bad mom, feelings of just that general negative tape, that general negative cognition where you just are not um, up to the task. You're just not up to um, to being a mom, and then increased purposeless movement. Um, sometimes we see pacing handwriting, can't sit still. This is particularly true with anxiety, um, where we see um, what we would call psychomotor agitation. So this ability, this need to pace, or this need to wring your hands, or not able to sit in your seat for a period, period of time, where the, where the energy is coming from inside and doesn't feel controllable. It doesn't feel like you have control over that process. So that can be very, very hard. Um, and so that's certainly an indicator where you would want to be reaching out um, for more help relative to postpartum anxiety and um, also postpartum depression. So what are we gonna do, right? We now know kind of that list of symptoms. We know what we're looking for. We know that our antenna's up. Now what, right? The, the proverbial um, step in life where we have to think about what's next. Um, so we're going to be looking at a couple of things here. First of all, counseling. And so psychotherapy, counseling, um, and those words generally are, are um, replaceable with each other for at least the purposes of this discussion, um, come in a couple of different slants. They come in a couple of different um, arenas. And so let's just talk for a minute or two about these. Supportive psychotherapy is what we think of as, as traditional psychotherapy. You are in a room or you're on a Zoom that looks very much like this. Um, it's one-on-one -on -one and it's you and the therapist. And of course, the power of this, the power of therapy is not only the relationship that you build with the therapist, um, and, and hopefully we're gonna find you someone that's um, a really good match for you and, and someone that um, fits well within your world. Um, but the power is that you are able to say anything to that person without judgment or reaction. And so that individual one-on-one -on -one is often enough to help someone manage their postpartum depression or their postpartum anxiety, that one-on-one -on -one counseling. We very often will, su will support and also um, rotate in couples counseling. And that's because your significant other, your partner in life, your husband, um, for the purposes of this discussion at least, um, doesn't know what's going on. They don't always understand. And so um, it's hard to describe your inner life, your inner feelings around significant anxiety and significant depression. And so sometimes you're, you, the other part of the couple just doesn't get it. They don't understand what's going on. It probably will make him fearful and scared. And so what we would do is certainly bring um, you two in together to do some educating. You see the word here, psychoeducation, just a kind of a silly word that we use um, for educating about what's going on. And so not only are we going to be educating you as the client in terms of normalizing things and really feeling and that you understand what's going on, we're also going to be bringing in the other part of the couple, so um, your spouse. Now, I will say that at times we may widen that net um, and it may be very, very appropriate um, for some psychoeducation and for some counseling to bring in anyone else that's really close to you in your social circle. So that might be your mom if she's coming to stay with you for a few weeks um, post-birth. It might be your mother-in-law. It could be a sister or a sister-in-law or a friend. Um, anyone that's really close in your inner circle, if they're having a hard time understanding postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression, then we want to be helpful um, with that. We want to step in and, and take care of that. And interpersonal psychotherapy is very similar to, to what we described above. Support groups can be very helpful. Um, and support groups can, can not only give you a sense of community and a sense of not being alone. Remember, we talked about that 70% number earlier. 
but the support groups are you're able to understand that I'm not the only one that's experiencing this and that there are others that may have had this before and have some coping strategies that I can then borrow, right, essentially, or replicate. Um, so support groups can be hard. Now, a word about postpartum depression. Postpartum depression can be challenging because if you're feeling depressed and you're dragging and you're feeling negative and really feeling sad, it's really hard for me to talk to you, talk you into going to a group. So imagine feeling down and depressed and, and really, and I say, go on Tuesday night, there's gonna be eight other people, you're gonna, you're gonna do great. Um, I can understand where that would be a stretch, but know that sometimes I will ask a client to stretch. I will ask a client and say, I know this is beyond your comfort level right now, beyond how you are feeling. I'm gonna ask you to do that. And of course, technology has really helped with this. So lots of support groups, lots of, of information and support online to look a lot like this does right at this moment. And so know that that, that certainly helps. It helps relative to um, scheduling. It helps relative to um, getting it in. In fact, many postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression groups, support groups happen late at night um, after things have settled down a bit, um, making sure that you have some extra support there. Medications can be helpful. Um, it's not our first line typically, um, and that's true at West Bergen. It's true in, in many other places where medications are not the usual first line um, of treatment. And it's never, at least at West Bergen, it's never the primary um, center of the wheel. It's, it's an adjunct to other things. Um, the one thing I would say on, on medications is please be really careful and make sure that you consult someone that absolutely knows what they're doing relative to postpartum depression. Because um, obviously if you're, you're thinking about um, medication as, as an alternative, and that might be an antidepressant, um, an SSRI or, or something like that, and you're breastfeeding, then there, there are some issues that you really need to be mindful of and think through. And of course, your medical professional is gonna be the most helpful with that. Um, and then again, psychoeducation, I cannot stress that point enough. Um, educating folks and, and keeping folks uh, together um, and moving in the same direction, understanding what's happening and why it's happening um, is really probably the most important thing that you can do besides counseling. So if we were to prioritize this, we're going to do individual counseling, couples work slash family, whatever works for your uh, situation. I would love to see support group in place because I think that that helps a lot. Um, and then medications and, and psychoeducation if needed. Um, I hope that I hope that certainly makes sense. Here's a, a reflection on how partners, family, and friends can be helpful. Um, the positive, we, we talked earlier about how it's sort of this paradoxical diagnosis, how you're, you're in the middle of this great time in life and wonderful and exciting change in your, in your world. And you're really, and then there is, by the way, a part of you that is very happy and is very excited and is very positive. Um, but know that um, the good news about it being typically close to the birth of a baby is there are usually people around. And so we're going to build a team for this postpartum anxiety. We're going to build a team for this postpartum um, depression. And so know that we're going to be asking your partners, your family, your friends, those people that surround and love you and support you. Um, we're going to be asking them to know the signs. So um, I'm happy to share this PowerPoint if that's helpful through the Valley system. Um, also, um, please feel free to blame it on us. So know that, that, and I say this to parents often when we give a talk, know that um, if you maybe go to dinner tonight and um, talk to your significant other or your friends or your family, let them know that you went to a talk on this and that um, you just want to kind of put it out there just in case. Um, your friends want to be listening to, to her. They want to be listening well. They want to be listening in an open with open-ended questions. Um, they want to be sticking to um, that non-judgmental listening position. And that could be a really hard because because imagine saying, how are you doing? How are you feeling? What are you feeling? And you start to start to say, I'm a lousy mother. I'm not good at this. I'm not qualified for this. And it would be very loving for a significant other or a family member or friend to sort of jump on you and say, that's silly. That's absolutely not true. You are qualified. And by the way, you probably are. They probably are right. But when they're asking those open-ended questions, you're going to be teaching your, your partners and your families to be sitting with some things and not interrupting you and really saying, because if that's how you feel, that is how you feel. And so um, we're going to be asking them to give support. 
Um, we're going to be asking them to encourage um, help when needed. So often, very often, um, it's hard for people to ask for help. And so we're going to be asking our partners, our families, our friends um, to be encouraging you to seek help when needed and encouraging you to do what you need to do. We're also going to be very practical. We're going to be asking your partner, your family, your friends to be helping with physical tasks of child caring, um, taking care of the baby for a while, giving you a break, allowing you to sleep, sleep probably the number one predictor of what's gonna get you back. Um, in, and, and I get that sleep's really hard when there's a newborn. And so to the extent that partners and family can help with that, um, certainly we're gonna be asking them to do that. We're also gonna be asking families and friends to hold you accountable. Meaning if they see that you're struggling, if they see that you're not doing well, we're gonna be asking them to nudge you a bit and develop a plan and say, I can help you with this. And so that might mean that your family member or your friend or your partner is going to be looking for the therapist or looking for the support group or doing kind of the, the footwork to, to kind of put some counseling in place if that's of course what you decide. Um, but do not be shy in asking your family and your friends to help. Always remembering, always, 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 that small fires are so much easier to put out than big fires. Um, and that is true in, in physical health, but it's so true in, in mental health. So we know what we're doing. We know what the, the support system is gonna be. We've, we've taught our families and friends. And when should we seek treatment? In other words, when is it those, those blues that we talked about or that nervousness that we talked about? Or when is it that we should cross that line and actually seek some professional help? So think about a couple of these things. So if symptoms persist for more than six weeks, six to eight weeks post-birth, um, if the symptoms are significantly still there and they're not getting better. So in other words, really take a breath, take a breath and reflect. Does week two feel any different than week four or five? And is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Is it about the same? Um, if the symptoms are persisting for that amount of time, then I would be considering uh, professional help. Um, if they're getting in the way of daily tasks, so if you're not able to take care of your baby or you're not able to take care of your surroundings or deal with your, your five-year-old or your seven-year-old or your 10-year-old, if you're not able to do those kind of things, whatever that daily task list is, then my antenna's up and I would be thinking about um, seeking some treatment. When others notice that something is wrong, um, whenever I do an assessment, I'll, I'll often have a couple in and at least spend some time with with the uh, identified client and, and their significant other. And, and the client will go through how they're feeling and what they're thinking. And then I always make it a point to look at the family member, the closest family member and say, what is really going on? What is your perspective? Because often it's post folks that are closest to us see really what's going on, even when we're having a hard time because of our anxiety, um, noticing things are going on. And you can't control your thoughts and your feelings. So when your thoughts and your feelings are feeling out of control or feeling like they're running away from you, then I would be considering um, seeking extra help. If the symptoms are severe, start to reveal themselves. So psychosis or delusion. And when I say that, um, this happens at a very small percentage of postpartum cases, but it does happen um, where there's an underlying psychosis or an underlying delusion. Um, and so if there's any of that going on, a, a break from reality, um, silly talk or talk that makes no sense at all, um, then you're gonna wanna be seeking some treatment um, for help without question. Um, and again, not overly worried about that on a, on a statistical basis that happens in a, in a single digit um, on a percentage wise um, basis across the board. All right, as we start to come to our, our end here in, in our, our 30 minutes, so we have a couple more slides left. I wanted to spend a little bit of time because we know what we're looking for. We know what symptoms, we know what our precursors are. We know how we're gonna ask our family and friends to be helping us. We know what the treatment is roughly going to look like. And I'm mindfully aware as the leader of West Bergen that how to find a mental health professional if you've never had one before is huge. It's really a big, big deal if you've never had to do that before. And remember on top of that, you're not feeling well. So, so I wanna give you a couple of, of really concrete and um, specific tips on, on how to do that. So first thing you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be consulting with your OBGYN professional team. And so that's gonna mean the doc or the uh, advanced practice nurse or, or 
um, whatever your team consists of, because they are folks that have seen this before. They're folks that deal with us. And so you're going to want to be starting the conversation there. Um, they may have absolutely a network of both clinicians, um, MDs, LCSWs, and, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but my guess is that they would have a pretty significant list. If that doesn't work, then you're going to be asking um, your friends for a referral. So the wonderful thing about stigma having come down over the last generation or so is that we're much more likely to be openly talking about, I have been in therapy before. I have had a good experience. And so the wonderful part of that is it's a little less embarrassing to go to your sister, your neighbor, your cousin and ask, do you know anyone that's good? I, I really need to find someone to speak to. Um, so don't hesitate to ask friends for referral, of course, if you feel comfortable. Clergy and community leaders always have a list. Um, certainly clergy of any kind um, always has a nice list of, of clinicians. Um, I am going to encourage people to find someone with, with experience in postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, especially if medication is being considered. It's a significant decision. And I just want to be very, very clear about that. There are a number of specialty treatment programs and providers. So um, the wonderful thing about having just a wonderful network, not only in the West Bergen world, but in the Bergen County area, there's a lot of therapists in the West Bergen, in, in the uh, Bergen County area. And, and the wonderful thing is that people have begun to specialize in a way that I love. Um, so I know that we can find you someone that really has background experience and a competency in postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression. I'm going to be looking for someone with that ex level of expertise. I think a, a general practitioner would be wonderful and probably do okay, but there are, there are some subtleties, there are some nuances, there are some uh, issues that are just more uh, specifically trained with folks that, that just understand it a bit better. Generally, you're gonna be looking for a licensed professional. So, um, and that might look like an LCSW, you may see those initials or an LPC, that's as a licensed professional counselor or a licensed psychologist. We always want the word licensed. It, it, it helps us know that they have a certain level of education. They've had to pass a number of tests. So we know they have a certain level of competency. Of course, it's not the be all and end all, but um, I would be wanting anyone that you see to be licensed no matter where they are um, or, or her that, how that, um, plays out. Just a quick word because people confuse it sometimes, the difference between a therapist and a counselor, and I'm using, I'm using those words interchangeably in this moment, and a psychiatrist. And so know that the way that that current mental health treatment sort of has come along in, in 2022, um, for the most part, the therapists or the counselors those licensed people we talked about before, the licensed clinical social workers, the licensed professional counselors, they are doing the therapy. So they are doing the weekly talk therapy. They are figuring out the why about what's going on and also helping you develop a strategy for going forward. They are doing the therapy. Well, the psychiatrists who are medical doctors, MDs are doing the medication. And psychiatrists, um, although certainly well-trained, are not always as adept at doing the therapy part Psychiatrists tend to focus in on the symptom, significant anxiety, I can't sleep, I'm having panic attacks, I feel depressed, I can't get out of bed, I feel that sad. They're gonna focus very much in on that symptom and try to develop a, a medication regime that will, will approach and attack that particular symptom. They don't always get involved in sort of the why or where are we going with this. So my preference is that you see a therapist um, for therapy, a counselor for therapy, and a psychiatrist for the medication part. And I realized that that involves two professionals. Um, the studies uh, over and over show us that, that those two in conjunction have the best outcomes and have better outcomes than either one of them um, alone. So just a word about that. I, I, I really do know that there's, there's confusion about um, what a therapist is about and, and what's the difference between that and a, um, a counselor. So, right. As we come to our end, there is good news here. And I usually start with the good news. I, I'm not sure why I put this toward the end. I, I will flip it the next time. Um, postpartum and depression is very treatable. That is the good news here. Know that as poorly as you might be feeling or your friend or your family member or your spouse might be feeling, please know that treatment is very, very, very available and very, very, very effective. And so that's the good news here. And so what I usually say to someone that's really struggling with, with postpartum anxiety or postpartum depression, I usually get them to focus just for a minute or two and 
ask them to at least hear my words that treatment is available and treatment is effective and that they do not need to feel the way they're feeling. And so I ask them no matter what their heart tells them because their, their heart's usually blocking, right? And it's saying, no, I feel lousy. I, I don't feel good. I'm always gonna feel this way because I, I understand that feeling, um, but know that that's not true, that that treatment really absolutely does work. And with stigma coming down, more people are much more willing to talk about it. Here we are at a lunchtime having a brief discussion about postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression. It's astonishing to me. I have to tell you from a public health point of view, it's, it's, it's beautiful. I love it. Um, and of course, the good news is we're, we're always wanting to listen to each other as, as uh, people and, and places and things. And so with that, we're about at the 35 minute mark. So I'm gonna just wrap here for a moment and open up to see if anyone has any questions or anything that they might want to uh, offer. Wonderful, Michael. You're always so so wonderful to listen to. So I do have one question. Sure. And uh, folks at home, if you have more questions, pop them into the chat or the, the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, so are there any at-home tips for dealing with intrusive thoughts, specifically your mind wandering about all that could go wrong? Absolutely. So part of anxiety is intrusive thoughts. Part of anxiety is um, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. So I'm taking care of my baby and I'm talking to my mother-in-law and I'm, I'm doing all that, that to-do list, right? All those, those things that I'm supposed to be doing, but intrusively, and, and it's a, it, it's a, such a descriptive word. The thoughts kind of come in. What if my baby gets sick? What if I get sick and I'm not able to take care of my baby? What if I die? What, I mean, it can, it can get, it can go to a dark place fairly quickly. And so intrusive thoughts are two things. One, they are absolutely a sign that you may be struggling with an anxiety type disorder that will seek treatment. I, I would think about if the intrusive thoughts are in the way and you're working around them and you're having difficulty um, getting through the day, I would think about going to see someone um, just because I think intrusive thoughts are a symptom rather than a, a, you know, an, an act unto themselves. Having said that, there are things you can do. Certainly a structure absolutely helps with intrusive thoughts. So intrusive thoughts can be distracting. So um, what I would be thinking about with a client with intrusive thoughts is literally a schedule. So what are you planning and want to get done in the morning? What are you planning and want to get done in the e afternoon? And what are you planning and want to get done in the evening? Why a schedule works is because it, it lends itself to a, a, a feeling of predictability and control. So where life is not so scary. If I know that this afternoon, and I'm not talking about a detailed schedule, I'm talking about three bullet points <laughs> or four bullet points, but that provides a level of emotional security and, and predictability is really what psychologically what we're going for. That absolutely will, will benefit someone with intrusive thoughts. Having said that, should they continue? Should they uh, modify or get worse? Um, I would be um, seeking some, some help. Um, also know, and, and I should have really put this in the slides, um, treatment really is effective. It absolutely works. The studies also show us that folks that struggle with postpartum depression and, and or postpartum anxiety do not tend to be in therapy forever. So I think, I think that sometimes people fear coming into therapy because it's like, oh my God, I know my, you know, my aunt Millie went to therapy her entire life and it didn't really work. And, and, and you know, and, and I get that. I absolutely get that. Know that for postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression, it tends to be episodic. So it tends to be an episode of, of, of depression or anxiety and it tends to be time limited. We tend to be able to jump on it, right? Fire extinguisher, skills, therapy, process, maybe medication. Um, and we tend to be able to put the fire out and you tend to, the overwhelming majority of people go on in their life. They raise their children in unbelievably wonderful ways and we never see them again. <laughs> and that, and by the way, here's a little secret. We don't want to see you again. We, we want you to have such a successful life. We want you to be out there raising your children and doing your thing. Always mindful of the fact, though, that, that it's important on all clinicians to do a good job because we want you to have a good experience with therapy so that maybe 10 years from now when there's something going on at your job or, or perhaps a relationship issue or some issues with your then 10-year-old, um, you would be much more open to just popping back into um, therapy. So know that therapy does not need to be lifelong. Um, so don't, don't worry that we, you know, you sort of start this process and can't get out of it. I, I hear that from a lot of people. I, I, I didn't call because I don't really want to be in that forever. 
boy, do I get that forever. I'm not, I'm not a, a, a therapy forever. Um, and listen, don't, I'm, I'm the head of West Bergen. Don't tell anyone, but I'm, I'm really, I am not a fan of therapy forever. Cause I think that our job is to actually teach you skills and for you then to go on with your life. Right. Uh, I think, I think that's our job. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I have a quick question. Oh. I've often read um, or heard that postpartum depression can be brought on by sort of physiological things that occur yeah. during childbirth, hormonal changes, sometimes drugs that are used to induce labor. I don't know if that's is yeah. that um, something that you've heard? Is that something that should be looked into prior to going to therapy? Or is that is that just part of your, your care team should include your, obviously your OBGYN as well as sure. a therapist? I, I, I just was wondering. Really great question. And the answer is probably yes. <laughs> that's And that's about where medical science is these days. But I find it almost impossible to believe that your, your body could go what it goes through for nine months and then you deliver a child and then suddenly there's this acute disruption or onset of anxiety or depression and it's unrelated to the to the body in the nine months it's, it just makes it absolutely has to be part of now whether that's the actual hormonal flow of the nine months or whether that's um, some medication that was given during um, during childbirth it almost doesn't really matter, but it's why my first suggestion on who to speak to was your OBGYN team, right. um, because they have the most experience. They're the, the ones that are up close um, with that area. And so they're the ones that, that have seen this over and over and over again. I have actually seen it a number of times where um, it also has to do with menstruation and the cycle. And so once that kind of goes back into a rhythm and a flow that, that people do feel better. I don't always put that out there because I don't want people to put it off because they often will like, it'll go on for month two, three, four. It's why I put a timeline around it. If you are still feeling this after eight, six to eight weeks, I would be wanting you to, to reach out for some help. I don't, I don't want that, that bullet point to say six or eight months. That's not, that that's too long. Right. Um, so yes, I think that that's all part of it without question. It's why if, if you're considering medication and antidepressant or something like that, we need someone very, very well trained to, to both understand what went on in the last nine months medically, and also what's going to go on in the next two to 10 months medically. Your body is still rebuilding. It's still reacting. It's still going, quote unquote, going back to normal, whatever that means. Um, but th there, there is a process there. And so we want to, we want to be mindful of that. So yes, absolutely. Okay. 